Um, okay, so this paper is joint work with Jerry Behrman, Susan Parker, and Wei Lung. Um, and it's work in progress. That's why we don't have really a completed working paper yet. So these are kind of recent results and we very much value your feedback. Um, let's see, the goals of this paper um, is to evaluate, well, the Prospera program is basically the Progressa program, you know, and there have been a lot of papers written about the Progressa program in Mexico. Um, I mean, I started working on this project like more than 20 years ago, because um, it started in 1998 when they did the original RCT. Um, and the name of the program has changed, like with every president, they basically give it a new name. And I think the current name is actually something different, <laughs> but it was called Prospera um, during the time period of our data collection. And there were a lot of studies of the effect of this conditional cash transfer program on schooling, like school enrollment, um, educational attainment, you know, studies that demonstrated pretty strong effects, but we have not been able to study the effects on learning yet. So, um, and the reason is because we didn't have test score data, you know, from the schools. And so in this paper, that's the main question that we're trying to address. Um, but we also want to just understand the effects on enrollment and, and grade progression and educational attainment as well because it's been you know, more than 20 years. And so a lot of things can change over time. Um, so what we do is we develop and estimate a dynamic model of student enrollment, school choice, um, academic achievement and grade progression. And the achievement is measured by standardized tests in math and Spanish. Um, and the enrollment decisions um, in Mexico, kids actually can choose from different schools, you know, or their parents can choose um, given what's available in their local area. So the enrollment decisions are choices about what type of school to go to, if to go to school at all or to drop out. Um, and it's determined by local school availability. Um, so the main challenge in evaluating the effects of a CCT program on academic achievement is the problem of select, selective school attendance because the tests are given in school, you know, and then many children drop out of school. So we're following children up through grade nine in this paper. Um, it's actually, there is a compulsory schooling law, but a lot of kids drop out before grade nine. Um, so we're following them grade four through grade nine because we have, that's the number of years we we have data from 2008 to 2013, so we can follow them over that time interval. Um, and the conditional cash transfer program induces children to stay in school longer who who might have otherwise dropped out. You know, so if you just look at mean test scores, it can make it appear as if the mean goes down if you if you don't control for selection because they're bringing in the kids at the bottom margin. There's also selection into different kinds of schools um, and there's selection from grade retention, you know, so there are actually multiple sources of selection. Okay, and you can think of the selection problem as being dynamic because at any grade, you know, the kids at risk for dropping out depend on the selection in the previous grade. So that's kind of the main methodological issue that we have to address. Um, so just some background, probably you already know a bit about conditional cash transfer programs, but they began in Brazil. I think Brazil had the first program, but Mexico um, evaluated their program using an RCT where they randomized localities. Um, so there were many studies of the Mexican program. I actually have a JEL paper with uh, Susan Parker, and we review about a hundred studies of that program actually. So there are two goals from these programs. One is to reduce poverty and the other is to encourage human capital investment. Um, and, and the transfers are given to families, usually to the mothers, um, conditional on the children attending school. At the high school level, the transfers are given directly to the kids, but, but the data that we're studying is up through grade nine. So they were usually given to the mothers. Um, and then they demonstrated, you know, early on substantial impacts. And this led to a scaling up of these programs within Mexico, 
And then also, you know, the World Bank also supported these programs a lot and they spread all around the world. So about 60 countries now have programs that are, you know, different types of conditional cash transfer programs. So they're now in Asia, you know, like Bangladesh and a lot of African countries have them too now. Okay. Um, so the, the question we're trying to address is whether it increases academic achievement. And we're using this newly available administrative data that we got from the Mexican, um, it's like their Center for Education Statistics and it's national test score data. Um, and it's both on school enrollment and on these tests that the kids take in every grade. So in the US, they don't have any national tests that everybody takes. But in Mexico, they actually have these national tests that kids take, I think as early as starting grade three, you know, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then in grade 12. And it's given to all kids, private and public schools, you know, so it really has a lot of coverage. Um, and they're called the Enlace tests. Um, so it's supposed to just be more of a diagnostic assessment of learning outcomes. Um, Sorry, that's my husband. <laughs> Hopefully you don't hear he's making coffee, grinding the beans. Um, but it's a diagnostic test of learning outcomes. But in grade nine, the test is actually used in when kids apply to high school. Um, the high schools look at the test score because some of the high schools are selective. So at that point, it's kind of a higher stakes test. But for most of the grades, it's kind of a low stakes diagnostic exam. Um, so 15.1 million students took the test in this one year. Like altogether, our database includes like 43 million students. Um, okay, so there's a small literature looking at the Enlace test scores. Um, there was a conference about three years ago where they, um, what they did is they merged the administrative data on, on who's a Prospera beneficiary with the test score data. Um, and then there were a few studies, you know, trying to estimate Prospera impacts. Um, I guess we had a study too, so I probably should include our study. But um, so there were a few studies that compared beneficiaries with non-beneficiaries and beneficiaries with more or less time in the program. Um, there was one study, I think these are still working papers, but this paper I think recently got published. This paper, it merged the 12th grade in LASE tests with labor force data and shows that the test score is highly correlated with labor, labor market performance. Um, and then they also show that like the grade six test scores are highly correlated with later test scores. Um, let's see, so, so there are only a few papers actually using these databases. Um, I, I'll kind of keep the literature shorter so that I can show you more of the results since we only have an hour. But it's related, our study is related to a lot of different literatures. So there's the literature on school choice and modeling the effects of different types of schools. I think the earliest paper was Derek Neal, and he was looking at Catholic schools versus you know regular public schools. Um, so there, there are a lot of papers, like also Altanji, that this paper is looking at Catholic schools. This paper, Sapelli and Vial, was looking at um, school vouchers in Chile, like private voucher schools versus the public schools. Um, these papers are looking at charter schools, the Rouse and the Figlio and Rouse charter schools. Um, this paper also looks in Chile at the voucher schools. Um, this is a paper with me also that looks at voucher schools. And Angris, this, this paper is looking in Colombia at um, private schools where they also got randomized vouchers. You know, so we're also going to be looking at different types of schools. Uh, I have some slides explaining the different types children can choose from. Um, and, and so the, all these types of papers estimate school choice models, right? Like the decision to go to one type of school versus another. There's another strand of literature that estimates similar models, but for somewhat different purposes. Um, so like this literature, Apple, this is with Holger Z, my colleague, they, they try to study the welfare consequences of policies such as closing schools. You know, so if people could choose from five schools and then you close a school, 
you know, how do you figure out the welfare consequences? And then they also analyze like how people value school characteristics. This Hastings, she has a, some of the earliest papers on that. These are kind of IO type models applied to the school choice problem um, where they, val how do people value characteristics of schools? So it's similar models, but for a little different purpose. Um, and then we, we, for the achievement of production function, we use a value added model. And there's a very big literature also on value added modeling. So these are models that relate current test scores to lag test scores. Um, and the models, you can give these models a structural interpretation as a educational production function. And one of the earliest papers to discuss this is Birdman and Murnane, you know, but under certain assumptions on the production function coefficients, I mean, the most general model would, would just write current achievement as a function of the entire history of educational and family inputs, as well as endowments. But if you make some assumptions on the coefficients in this most general function, like about how they decay over time, um, then the lag test score is a sufficient statistic for prior outputs, or inputs, sorry, prior inputs. Um, and so then you can write current test score as a function of lag test score plus intervening inputs, um, like from the current period. And this is important because we don't have any data sets that include the entire history of inputs. You know, so usually you have to impose some sort of assumptions. So, so this is Ken and I have this paper where we kind of discuss this, these assumptions. This is published in EJ. Um, you know, so we're using this type of value added model. And then there's a recent literature also about value added modeling. Some of these models, they estimate teacher fix effects to measure teacher effectiveness. Um, and that, I would say that's controversial, you know, because a lot of times you don't have random assignment of teachers to classes. You may not have a lot of observations, you know, so it might be noisy, the estimate. But, but these models, interestingly, they're actually used um, by schools. Like they have some consulting firms that sell the statistical software to schools. And then schools can figure out which teacher is effective and which one is not. And, and they actually use them for hiring and firing decisions sometimes. So, so these can be kind of high stakes. So there are a bunch of papers. There are even some papers where they had random assignment of teachers to classes, and then they could compare it with value added and, and they, they actually find that they, they're not bad. And so there's, there's some papers, but there are also some papers, um, I think Jesse Rothstein and um, Han Yushek have been more critical about using these teacher fixed effect models, especially Rothstein has been very critical. Um, okay, and then Raj Chetty shows that these test score gains that you can estimate with value added models are very predictive of adult outcomes. Um, he also finds that if you have a good teacher, that that really can affect your labor market outcomes later. Um, but the thing that we do that's a little different is we do these value added models in different grades and then link it across multiple ages and grades to analyze the longer term schooling um, effects of being in this Prospera program. Uh, okay, so just to give you a little background about why we set up the model the way we did, so Mexico has primary school, which goes through grade six, lower secondary school, which is grade seven through nine, um, and then high school, which is grades 10 to 12. And education is compulsory up to grade nine. You know, but we observe a lot of kids dropping out and working prior to finishing grade nine. Um, they have a standardized curriculum content. Uh, it doesn't mean that all states teach exactly the same thing, uh, but, but they do have a, a national guideline for what they're supposed to teach. And, and the tests we're looking at are curriculum-based tests. So every year it's supposed to be testing the curriculum in, in that grade. Um, so at the primary level, almost all kids go to general school, but there is also an indigenous option. So indigenous, they're kind of like American Indians in the US, you know, they're, um, more of an Indian population. Um, and in Mexico, those schools are bilingual. 
because they speak a lot of different languages. So one of the challenges with indigenous is that they speak, I think, like five different languages. So, um, so we model the choice when there's an indigenous option available, we model the choice to either go to regular or indigenous school. And then in secondary school, there are three types of schools, which is general school, technical, which is kind of vocational. And then they also have this type of school called telesecondary. Um, and this is very interesting because Mexico has had that type of school since 1968. And it's a distance learning school, but it, kids actually go to a school and then there is a teacher there that guides them in their studies but they see the lectures over video. So it's like over television, you know, so they have very good teachers delivering the lectures, but the teachers are from Mexico City and the, and the kids are seeing recorded lectures. I, I think they might be real time actually, like over the television that every day they, well, they're recorded, but they show every day the lecture for that day. Um, so they do go to school, you know, somebody's taking attendance and everything, but and there is one teacher, I think, that kind of guides their homework and shows the videos, um, but it's a different type of, of learning. And then they have high schools, um, and high schools are a little bit different organization. Um, some are affiliated with universities. Then the university system is kind of similar to the US, um, and they have some rules about child labor. Uh, you're, you know, people under 14 years of age are not supposed to be working. And then there's a restriction on how many hours they can work for people 14 to 16. But again, it's not very well enforced. You know, if you look at the census data, you see plenty of kids. I think like 8% of kids about age 12 were reporting working for pay. So it's just not that well enforced. I mean, it's difficult to enforce. So in this study, we're using multiple data sources. We have this test score data that I told you about, the Enlace data. Then they also gave a random, for a random sample of schools in every year, they collected survey data. And if the school was sampled, they collected data from the students, parents, teachers, and principals. You know, so, and that's about 3.4 million students filled out those surveys. So we're, we're focusing on the students for which we have surveys because then we know a lot about their family background. Um, then we have geocode data that we did ourselves to figure out the distances to different types of schools. Um, we have administrative data on the Prospera beneficiary status. So it's not self-reported. It's because, um, you know, some of the young kids may not know if their parents are getting Prospera or not. So that's, I think administrative is better. Then we have school characteristics from a school census. And then we have some labor market data um, that we use to figure out wage offers that the children could, like approximately the wage they would earn if they were not in school. Um, and in this paper, we're focusing on fourth graders in 2008 and we follow them up through grade nine. You know, if they fail a class, then we may, because we follow them to 2013. You know, so they could fail and then we'd see them up to grade eight or something if they failed. Um, and we focus on public schools because very few of the Prospero students attend private schools. Um, and Petra, for the administrative test score data, do you have that linked to teachers so you can do the, the teacher value added type progression? You have it linked to teachers, although in this paper we're not doing that, but um, we do want to do, we have tried it out, it does work. Um, you know, in, in middle school, they have multiple teachers and so we can't always link which teacher they had in middle school. Like we know what grade the teacher teaches. In primary school, when they have one teacher, we can link everybody that, to what teacher they had. Yeah. Yeah, it could be that some of the school types are better because the teachers are better. We have been looking at the characteristics for different types of schools. Hi, Petra. Uh, I was wondering, so you could see uh, school entries and exit, right? Because you have the, the universe of schools. Are you going to think on that margin, like when, when parents have more cash and they become more picky, like uh, that could make competition more severe and schools could improve? Like, um, do you take that into account in this analysis or? No, but we can see that. Um, 
right now we're just using this. Well, there, there wasn't all that much. We did look at the entry. You know, there wasn't a lot of entry in terms of the numbers of schools changing over time. So right now we just have the, the universe of schools that are available. I think we just picked one year, you know. Um, but we can actually allow the choice set to vary by the, we want to look at that also the private school, you know, private schools tend to be smaller and it could be that the private options affect like, um, you know, competition and how good the public schools are. I think all those questions would be very interesting. I mean, we just got these data last year and the data sets are huge. So I, I spent the whole year doing data cleaning basically. So we do want to do like some studies exactly along the lines you're suggesting, like how the, the market for schools affects the performance. Yeah. But we haven't in this paper. This is like our first paper that we, we start working on with the data. Um, okay, so this just gives you a rough idea. Uh, so the ink, the pesos, they're about, I think during this time it was maybe 12 pesos per dollar. So the income is is pretty low by by our standards. Um, we have like urban rural status, number of children. This shows you the Prospera and the non-Prospera. So the number of children is higher in the Prospera group. The indigenous, you know, is higher in the Prospera group. Um, there are differences, especially in mothers and fathers education. You can see in the Prospera group, a lot of the dads and the, and the moms um, have only primary school. So sixth grade education or less. You know, so, and very few went to college. Whereas in the non prospera group, you know, it, it's quite different. And then you can see these are the number of observations for the fourth graders in 2008. So just that cohort. Um, part of the challenge working with the data is just that it's so large. And so we could incorporate other cohorts too. Um, so this just gives you a rough idea of the, this is not controlling for selection. So there's no model, but you can kind of get a rough idea of the, the type of data we're dealing with. So there's math score, Spanish score. The mean is 500. Um, and then the standard deviation is 100. So like 20 points would be um, 0.2 standard deviations. So it's pretty easy. Um, so you can see the gap between say, these. this is general school and this is dividing the kids by the secondary school that they go to. And the interesting thing that we see is that telesecondary, you know, the Prospera kids start out at a disadvantage, you know, um, and then you see them really kind of closing the gap, you know, but, but part of this could be selection, you know, that some of the best kids that it, may, it may be more selective in telesecondary school that the best kids are the ones staying in school, you know, and then that the other kids are dropping out. So it, it's really important to um, control for selection. Um, let's see. And then you can see that they're actually like doing better even than the, in some of the other school types, you know. So one of the curious things that we see is telesecondary seems to be pretty good. Despite the fact that telesecondary is usually in rural areas and the teachers tend to be lower qualified or less qualified than, than in the other schools. Um, and, and then the dropout differences, let's see. Here, the gap in dropout, you can see um, that the dropout's higher for the, for the Prospera group. P equals one is always Prospera and then P equals zero is not. And, and you have no data prior to uh, Prospera? Well, they were probably in Prospera even in earlier grades, you know, because the program's been around a long time. Yeah. Um, usually if people qualify for it, they do want to be in it because it's a lot of money. It, it can be 20% of their income. Um, we have grade three data, but then we could only follow them to grade eight. You know, so that's why we pick grade four to be able to follow them to the end of the lower secondary school. Um, 
So okay. we, we could but, go back. But, yeah, but I, I shouldn't be concerned in any way that I, I, I was expecting to see kind of one age where the means across the two groups were, were very similar because the household had recently just joined Prospera. But 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 kind of the, the way the data work is you see it only after these kids were in the program for a few years. Well, they don't start getting the transfers until third grade. You know, but the Prospera is a family status and they get money for each child. So they might have siblings that are in the program. So the family might be receiving money for those siblings, but that one child would not start getting transfers until third grade. And in Mexico, attendance is almost universal up through sixth grade. Um, so the third grade to sixth grade transfers are almost just transfers. You know, it doesn't really induce that much difference in enrollment because most people are enrolling. I think 20 years ago, that wasn't true, but nowadays most people do complete to sixth grade. So, but then it really becomes kind of binding more at seventh grade because a lot of people drop out after sixth grade and they never transition to secondary school. Um, so this, this is just showing the breakdown in the different types of schools. You know, so the non-prospera tend to be more in general school. Indigenous is a small group. And, and one of the challenges is most of them are in the program. So, um, so we don't have much of a control group actually in, in the indigenous because almost all are in prospera. But then you can also see here the telesecondary a lot of the Prospera kids are in telesecondary, you know, more than, so the, if you look at the breakdown, non-Prospera tend to go more to general school and Prospera, you know, a lot of them actually didn't, because the poorest people tend to live in more rural areas. So that's, that's partly, um, they tend to be in telesecondary more. Let's see, this is grade retention. So in, in primary school, there's some grade retention. In secondary school, there's less. And I think probably a lot of the kids that are being retained here end up dropping out. You know, so, and we see less, we do control for grade retention, but it's mainly a phenomenon in the earlier grades. Um, yeah, and this is how people transit from different school types, you know, so you can see Indigenous are, are much more likely to be dropping out here. And, and then Prospera are, are also more likely to drop out and they're more likely to transit into the telesecondary type than the non-Prospera. That's why we also want to incorporate the school type choice, you know, since this is a different kind of school. Okay, so let me um, kind of describe the model that we wrote down. So they're, in primary school, they just choose between general and indigenous, and it depends on what's locally available. So right now our local is 20 kilometers, although I think this is maybe a little big, like we, we were gonna check sensitivity to smaller values, but that's how we define the local schools available. And then after grade six, they choose from general school, telesecondary or technical, also depending on availability. Um, let's see, and then the notation, this D-I-J-A is individual I enrolls, enrolled in school type J at age A. Um, and then it equals zero if they don't enroll in school at all. And then we also have like whether they repeated the grade and whether they get Prospera. So that's the notation. And then, Another thing we did is we wanted to allow for some treatment effect heterogeneity, you know, not that all kids are affected the same way. And we want to see, you know, is it the kids that are kind of the most poor that are getting the biggest benefit? That was, so what we did is we estimated propensity scores because in, in the treatment effect literature, it's very common to have the treatment effect depend on the propensity score, where the propensity score is probability of being a Prospera beneficiary. Um, and so the main eligibility criteria are household assets. And we have a lot of household assets in our data set. So we use that in constructing the propensity score model. And we can predict pretty well who's in the program or not. Um, we also excluded from our analysis from the beginning a small percentage of the sample 
for which propensity scores are close to zero. Because there's some kids, like if both your parents went to college, you know, you're pretty much totally different from the Prospera kids, you know, because it's just, I mean, we're going to check the sensitivity to exclude you or not, but you can think of this as kind of this common support, that there's some that are just not comparable at all, and you may not want to include it, kind of like not including the private schools, you know. Um, okay, so we do, we report the results separately by propensity score, and we included in the model some unobserved heterogeneity, which is in the form of discrete unobserved types that follow a multinomial distribution. So it's like right now we have four types. So this is to allow for unobserved in, like kind of endowment effects in the, it, that, and they can enter anywhere in the model. Um, so, so can I ask one thing? So, so P is, is not a choice variable itself in the sense there's no kind of stigma or anything getting into this program. It's not a choice. So once you, you're eligible for the program, then I guess it's a probability you enroll or you automatically will be enrolled in this, in this program. Well, nowadays, at first, people didn't know about the program, you know, so there were some people that didn't sign up. I don't think there's much of a stigma, or if there is a stigma, I think the benefits of the program are so large in terms of money that, um, you know, most people that are eligible sign up. Like, at first, they didn't know about it, so we had some people that just didn't even know the program existed, but now the program's been running for 25 years, um, so I think if if people qualified, they would want to get it. And the qualification is determined every year, so? No, they don't check on them every year. I think after three years, they review it, but it's pretty rare to get kicked off. Um, if if your circumstances got a lot better, you know, they, they'll put you onto like a modified lower form of the program, I think a little less generous. Um, but it was every three years they kind of review your eligibility. So. But, but I can't run down my assets to qualify for the program. Well, the things that they use for qualification, they're like, if you have a dirt floor in your house or if you have a car. So I guess if you got rid of your car, that might change your status. Um, they were, and like number of dependents per room in your house things like that. It's kind of, it's more of an asset-based measure and not so much an income-based measure because it's hard to measure income for some people, especially in rural areas where they do agricultural work. No. Uh, just one, one add-on. So in terms of modeling, we treat that Prospera as a time invariant status variable. So it's not a choice variable. Like you're born, like in the model, you're born with that, uh, with Prospera or without Prospera and the uh, carry on to the end of the model. There's no choice on that. Yeah, I think we couldn't really model a choice anyways to, I mean, I, people, I haven't seen the recent data, but I remember, you know, people that knew about the program were definitely interested in getting it because it increased their income by a lot. But they didn't always comply with all the, you know, the school enrollment because if you don't send, they verify attendance. So, um, and you have to send your child 85% a day. So if you don't send them, you know, then you wouldn't get the transfer for that child, but you could still get it for other kids that are attending school. That's just one more. So is there possible any sort of effects on parental labor supply because you're getting this, you know, sort of extra cash? Is that something that you will capture in the model or something that's gonna be left out? Um, well, there were some studies that showed that mothers were working more because child labor, ch children were working less and that mothers were actually working more. Um, these, I think Susan Parker had a paper showing that. In this paper, we're not really modeling parent labor supply. We're just taking as given if the mother works or if the father works. Um, we don't condition an income. Um, well, they it could affect your income, you know, because it gives you a lot of money, um, like twenty percent income increase in income. So, 
Yeah, actually, I want to do these results without conditioning on income. Well, we don't have a fine measure of income. We have um, brackets. You know, we, well, I showed you the brackets in, in that table. Um, I guess that's the one thing that I think is endogenous to family income because it can really, it could also affect mothers working, but. Yeah, because you mentioned about this ed education production function of, of skills. And I guess in that production function, um, you know, school is going to be in there, but the parental inputs in terms of, you know, parental labor supply and all the others are going to be fi held fixed or you know, right. some sort of constant there. Yeah, we have mom being at home or not. It's true. It could be partly affected by the program if mother's at home. Yeah, we, we can examine, like, if we take some of those out, if it changes anything. But we have like parents' education, you know, the idea being that if parents are more educated, they can help you more at home. Um, okay, so the, the model, so we have all those family background. We also know if the household speaks Spanish at home or some other language, which is important for the indigenous choice. We have minimum distances needed to travel to different school types, which we computed with the geocode data. Um, and then the time varying elements are like whether you attended school last year, because we assume if you drop out, you don't come back. We, we rarely assume kids coming back. So that's kind of simplification that's consistent with the data for the most part. Um, and then we have all the achievement test score data. And then we, we, ask, we don't have wages in the test score database, but we use the 2010 Mexican census to estimate a wage offer. Um, and there's some variables that enter the wage equation that don't enter anywhere else, you know, such as, um, well, we know their geographic location down to their municipality and locality. Um, well, we assume the wages enter or depend on grades, years of it, or age, grades, gender, um, parents' education. You know, so, so it's a very local wage. And then we have like state effects and everything. So, and then we do a two-step correction for like a Heckman two-step correction for working or not working for these kids. So this is different data, but we're imputing wages that the kids could earn if they dropped out of school. And then the value added model, the, there's a complication because of grade retention. You know, because if you get retained, then your lagged score would be the same grade, you know, so it's a totally different test. Um, so we allow the coefficient. So this is test M, which is math or Spanish, individual I, schooling type J. So we have a separate value added model for each type of school. So some types might be more effective than others. Um, and then at age A. So the model goes by age, you know, because you can't really make it go by grade with the grade retention issue. So it goes by children's ages. Um, and then the lag test score coefficient differs if, it, if they're repeating the grade or not. So this is if they pass the grade or not. And then this is the Prospera effect and we allow it to differ by quartile of the propensity score. So we're estimating four different Prospera effects for different propensity score quartiles. Let's see, and the unobserved heterogeneity. Um, okay, and there's a probability of passing, you know, so in the end, there's a school choice, which is a standard like multinomial logit model. Um, so these different pieces we put together in one likelihood, you know, so it's, it's from the beginning age to the ending age, integrate out over the unobserved types. And the outcomes that we see are the passing, the test scores, the, school enrollment decisions, um, and whether they drop out. Those are, those are the outcomes. Let's see, we don't see wages, you know, because the wages is coming from this other data set. Okay, so let me show you like our, some of our estimates. Um, this is the value added coefficients. Um, and we actually included lag math and Spanish scores in both the math and the Spanish equations. These are, for the, these are the coefficients for kids that are not retained because the model has a lot of other stuff because it has all the family background. Um, 
you know, but it's just too much to show on one table. But you can see like how the lag is important, you know, as you'd expect. Um, the lag math is less important than lag Spanish, say for Spanish. Um, we're finding, well, these are not really the program effects because within the value added structure, the program kind of the effects accumulate, you know, because if it increases your score in fourth grade, that helps you maybe learn the material better in fifth grade because your fifth grade score depends, or, or, you know, it kind of in seventh grade, if it increased your score in sixth grade and fifth grade, that would help you learn more in seventh grade. You know, so the Prospera effect comes through the lag and it also comes contemporaneously. Um, so you really have to simulate the model to see what the effect is. So these are just the coefficients. You can't see immediately what the effects would be simulated, but we're finding, you know, the indigenous, we're not really finding any benefit of Prospera for the indigenous sample. Um, and also for the other sample in primary school, we don't see a lot of evidence for like positive effects. But then starting in, in telesecondary technical in general, which is like seventh grade starting, and especially for the higher propensity score quartiles. So almost all the Prospera beneficiary, beneficiaries are in the top two quartiles, you know, because they have high probabilities of being in the program. We see positive effects. I mean, we'll simulate based on these coefficients. So you can see, um, this is the school choice parameter estimates. Uh, you know, so which, so like the Prospera, the top quartiles are much more likely to choose telesecondary. So the top quartiles tend to be the poorest kids. So they're more likely to go to telesecondary. The distance results make sense. You know, the further you live from a general school, the less likely you are to go. Um, this is the further away you are from technical, the less likely you go. So we'd expect this to be negative. And some kids don't have all the options. We're actually modeling whatever options they have. Like if you live in an urban area, there may, may not be a telesecondary, you know, so. And then if you live in a very rural area, you may only have a telesecondary. So we are like modeling that. And then also including the number of schools of each type, you know, and then the, the higher your wage, the less likely you are to go to any school for your wage offer. Um, so I'll kind of, um, can, can, can you go back a couple slides just for the uh, ability production function of the value added equations? So for, uh, for, for kind of the lags, I'm sort of surprised at how low the coefficients are and that I, I always think that kind of the lagged ability should be really persistent, you know, pre pretty close to one. And so it is the way that I should think about uh, the value added for, for ability, it, is it that I should be summing the, the two coefficients on lag math and lag Spanish or? Well, they'd have to be multiplied by the score and then you could sum it. I was also kind of surprised they seemed a little low. It is a different test, you know, and every year it's a curriculum based test. So it's like your geometry performance, you know, and the lag would be algebra or something, you know, because it's a test of the curriculum in that year. Right. I think and sometimes data sets have the same test given every year. Okay. You, you, yeah, because I'm just trying to think through if there was measurement error, I guess that would bias things down. Of course, that would bias down the long run effect of the program. And yeah. if there's some way to, it, I don't know, do, you know, kind of do one of these errors and variables sorts of approaches to, uh, you know, taking into account that you, you just have noisy measures of, of past ability. And, and yeah. whether there's something that can be done there. I mean, I... Well, one thing we're worried about, which we are trying now to take into account, is that a small percentage, they have this variable, which is kind of a statistical analysis of whether there was likely to be cheating in that class. You know, I mean, it's like, I think 3% of the kids um, are flagged as possibly having had some cheating. Um, there's this whole educational psychology literature where they develop all these algorithms for detecting cheating, you know, so we want to take that into account because there might be some cheating 
and it might be differential by type of school. So we do want to do kind of an errors and variables with an adjustment for possible cheating. We haven't done it yet, but yeah, we do want to have that kind of equation. Okay, so I'm going to skip like the goodness of fit just to be able to show you more how we simulate it. Um, so basically we simulate the model in the real data they had Prospera and we do the simulation where we take it away. Okay, um, so here you can see this is the distribution of the Prospera kids by quartiles. So they're almost all in the top three quart or top two quartiles. Because the quartiles were based on the whole sample, you know, and, and they almost all fall in the top two. This is educational attainment um, up through grade nine, you know, because it can still have effects on attainment going to high school. Um, and then this is the change in the dropout rate, you know, so this is a positive effect on attainment, although I think this is kind of small. Um, I kind of expected a bigger number here. And then change in dropout rate. Um, it has a significant effect on dropping out by grade nine. These are the effect on the achievement scores. And these different colors um, are different grades. And then these are different quartiles. So almost all the data is in these top two quartiles. So you can see like in primary school, you know, we don't really see much effect, you know, and there's even kind of a negative effect for sixth grade. So which is a little curious. I mean, I would have thought it was, the sample sizes are very large. So, you know, usually everything in the regression is very statistically significant because it's over a hundred thousand kids. Um, but this is how it accumulates. You can see that accumulates, we see bigger effects on math test scores than on Spanish. So it accumulates over, over the grades. So this is our evidence like of achievement impacts. Um, and then we broke it out by types of schools. And you can see that the secondary schools or tele-secondary schools are showing bigger impacts, actually. I mean, this is the average, but these schools appear to be generating pretty positive impacts. So this now controls for selection. I mean, you, you kind of saw earlier that it was like unbelievably large benefits, um, but those those previous numbers were not controlling for selection, and this this now controls for selection. Um, but the effects are bigger in math than in Spanish. Okay. Oops. Well, I mean, we showed these. Well, we we told the one of the former subsecretaries of education, he's kind of skeptical that these telesecondaries, there were a few papers finding a lot of benefits from these types of distance learning schools. And there was actually one dissertation from a grad student in Northwestern a few years ago, analyzing how expansion of telesecondary is correlated with increase in wages or labor market benefits. Um, and she found a lot of benefits you know, but the, I must say, when we told the subsecretary of, of high school education, he's a friend of, of Jerry's, um, Miguel Zeckley, he was kind of skeptical that these telesecondary schools would be this good. So that's partly why we're, we want to study a little bit more cheating, just to make sure whether the cheating rates could be different in the different types of schools. So that's what we're working on that now, actually. Um, okay, then this Let's see, Prospero status. Oh, these are just on the types of schools that they choose, how Prospera affects the school choice. You can see it has a pretty big effect on dropping out because you can accumulate this. This is drop out in seventh grade, drop out in eighth grade. You no, know, so this is how many kids don't drop out that otherwise would drop out if they didn't have Prospera. Um, then I looked at some school engagement variables, you know, to see the students report how many hours they study and whether they pay attention in class and whether they participate to see why is telesecondary looking so different. I mean, telesecondary, they do actually report they pay attention more in class and they participate more in class. You know, so there are some differences in school engagement.
actually, I didn't mention, but the technical schools also look better than the general schools um, in terms of having impacts. Technical and telesecondary are better than general, which is kind of the opposite. I'm thinking Mexico, they think the general schools are the best. Um, but it's partly selection, you know, because the wealthier kids tend to go to general schools. And, and what you showed in terms of the propensity scores is that the those with the highest propensities, I guess they have the highest returns. So there's, I guess it, 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 for the previous table, were you running basically everyone through the, at, at some level, the same uh, uh, school types? The, if, well, if you know I, what I mean. The, the, there, there's two ways to, to, to do it for the, for the ability of production. One is uh, you run every single simulated it, or every single individual through the different types of school productions given their, uh, given their you know, oh, No, we didn't I, do that. We, no. we simulate the choice of school. So we basically take yeah. away Prospera and simulate everything about that person over time. So we simulate what schools they would choose and do many simulations. You know, so for some yeah. simulations, they might have one trajectory and for some a different. But we're basically just removing the Prospera and simulating all their choices and all their outcomes. Yeah, because yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to think my way through for the, uh, that there's two sort of things going on. One is the actual value added of, of those particular schools, as well as the students who select in and, and what's the what's the gain for those particular students. And, and, and I guess that table it showed kind of both working together. Yeah. Is it, yeah, Eric, you're right. So it, uh, it, the... it, it'd be great to see some decomposition of just, it, it, you know, I, some I of these students who go to these different schools, the the telesecondary schools, that I, I I guess they would have high returns to go into school anywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the current table reports like the classification based on their initial choice in the baseline model. So you are you are definitely right. Like some kind of large effect that we pick up from uh, telesecondary school, may because some students transfer from other type of school to telesecondary school or the other way around. Um, yeah, so we, we have combined effects and uh, we can do further decomposition. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, but they do report higher rates of like paying attention and participating curiously in the school. You know, the, um, they are smaller class sizes in the telesecondary. Um, and then we also did the simulation where we removed telesecondary completely and say what would happen to these kids if they didn't have any telesecondary schools, you can see the dropout increases dramatically, actually. So these are kids who were in telesecondary. What would happen if we took away that option? That's what we did. Um, I mean, the test scores is partly because it's a different sample, but this dropout, you can see it goes up a lot. Then we looked at male-female differences. We're not finding huge differences. We're, we're finding females and males have very similar program effects. Um, the dropout benefits are slightly higher for women. So even though men are actually more likely to drop out, or boys, I guess, are more likely to drop out, but the girls actually have somewhat larger dropout impacts. Okay, so that's, that's all the results that we have um, so far. Uh, so we're finding, you know, significant impacts on achievement, especially in math, and especially in grades seven, eight, and nine. You know, not that we don't really see a lot of evidence in in the primary grades, though. Um, okay, and then these are roughly the the magnitude of the impacts. The telesecondary and technical school types seem to be better than the general type, um, and there are substantial effects on dropping out behavior. And it looks like the most disadvantaged children in the highest propensity score quartile benefit the most. And then girls seem to have slightly larger impacts than boys. Okay, so that's the last slide. Hopefully it's close to on time.
Um, do you have an idea what are the variances of achievements in these different types of schools? I was wondering, like maybe in general schools, like the teachers are focused on the good kids because they're really good. And in these uh, technical and teleschooling, um, kids are all bad. <laughs> so I think I the know. technical is not hugely different, like technical it's more vocational. It's supposed to have a little bit more vocational orientation. But in the US, there's also right now a big move towards vocational education. So they have all these career academies. They call them like career academies. And the vo vocational is not like it used to be. Like it used to be if you took vocational education, you did like how to fix cars and stuff like that. But now it's actually more college preparatory you know, and it's also in Mexico. It's also supposed to pre prepare kids for college. Um, so it's not just, it sounds like it could be bad, but I think it's actually not all that different from the general. Right, I was just wondering like, where do these progressive kids belong, like um, compared to their peers in the same school and how much attention they're gonna get uh, from the school or teachers. And it might be really different from uh, general school than from tele. Uh, schooling. Yeah, we can look at like how the variants, how they compare to yeah the rest, yeah. and also like maybe just uh, a little bit more on the teleschooling because we have so much pushback now uh, under the pandemic about distance learning. Like, how do they participate in class, and do they get help from th these good teachers that are giving the videos? Or no, they don't get help from those teachers. But there is another teacher in the class that is supposed to kind of help them do the exercises. Yeah, but the video is just, they watch the video, that's it. I, I guess the issue is sometimes the teachers don't have a lot of training. So they might be teaching material that they don't know themselves, you know? <laughs> and so therefore they might be better off watching the videos because they're high quality videos. And at least they're saying the right things, you know? Susan said she sat in on a class and the teacher was like struggling to do basic math on the board. You know, so in that case, you might be better off watching the video. That's... Right, that's interesting. Yeah, and Pong Pong, a different way to answer your question, instead of uh, looking at the variance, is directly say the, the class engagement, because we do have like individual levels uh, information about the students' engagements and also like how much effort they spend on their courses. And Patrick kind of show a little bit of related evidence in one of the slides, trying to understand why the telesecondary school is uh, kind of be better than the other type of school. And uh, we believe like the, the different engagements and the different efforts they spend on courses could be like one of the reasons. Also, we cannot really exclude, exclude other possible reasons on the other hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but maybe, yeah. And, and, and in terms of variance, I don't really have the variance breakdown by Prospera students or not, like by Prospera status. But the variance seems light larger in the general school or telesecondary school and a little bit smaller in the technical school. If we think about like the subgroups, but not by prosperous status. Mm -hmm. Wait, can I yeah. just one thing? Sorry. Yes, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say thanks. Like it kind of um, makes sense uh, that the variance will be bigger in, in uh, general schools. So just when, when you model the, the selection into different types of schools and because you have the production function and schools are directly like inputs to the production function, um, do you need, I guess you need some exclusion restrictions when you model the choices. And, and if so, what are the, the instruments that, that you use to that affecting the school choices but not directly affecting the, the, the skill accumulation? We use like the distance we're using the distance between the primary school and the secondary school. We're assuming that people live near their primary school because we don't know their exact home address, you know, okay. but then we were, but primary schools are much more prevalent. You know, people usually live close to their primary school. Right. But then to go to secondary, sometimes it could be a, quite a distance and they don't have busing. Uh -huh. so like we have school buses and stuff. They usually, you have to find your own transportation. Right. Right. Um, so that's one exclusion restriction. And then also like the number of schools of each type within your availability. Yeah. Right, right. Um, 
that basically you have to, I guess you somehow assume that location is, is exogenous in the sense that where you live. Yeah, that's true. And then we excluded, there was a small fraction of kids that moved state to state, you know, where they're not in the same place. So we excluded them because we would know the distance between like, because we're doing primary to secondary distance. I mean, I have to confess, when I saw the title, I thought there's RCT kind of a component in this because I I guess this is a nationwide program. There's no kind of randomized control component in it. It just- It was only the er early rural program, which ran for, the RCT ran for 18 months. Yeah, and then okay. even the program after that, when, the, when it wasn't nationwide, we did it like using matching. There was no right. RCT, like in the urban areas. Yeah, and now it's pretty much nationwide. What's the reason not to you know, write, a, write a paper about the long run effects of using those RCT, the early waves? Is it because of data? You don't have test score for those cohorts or? Yeah, we don't have test score. They, the Enlace data started later. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have a um, general question. So I was imagining if I were a fragile kid, uh, Maybe my first preference would be to go to tally schools because the tally schools would be, they would go easy on me. So, um, so is that uh, something that's, uh, I mean, uh, actually happen uh, in, the, in, 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 in practice? You mean that the kids well, I mean, I guess we do try to control for selection based on lag test score into different types of schools. Um, yeah, I think part of this question has been controlled by including the test score uh, in your school choices function. So if I'm a weak kid and have very low performance at my grade six, then it, I may have different uh, choices on my local schools compared with a better kids, uh, I mean, in terms of the performance at the grade six. So, but I don't, we don't really have any kind of non cognitive measures, like, uh, so that they may be played more strategically besides their, their test score performance. That, that part is kind of out of our scope. Oh, oh thanks. I'm, I'm not really sure I answered your question, Mark. <laughs> oh, sorry, I was just thinking about the, like the school choice, how, it, um, how is the hierarchy uh, looking um, from the perspective of the kids? What do they want? Whether they'd like to um, go to the general school, uh, maybe, maybe they don't want to have um, high intensity of homework and something like that. So, um, yeah, but, but it's just a, like a peripheral question. Uh, so next. Yeah, we did try to allow that like kids with low test scores may choose a different type of school because they want like a less rigorous school or yeah. Yep. But just the literature on school choice like distance is always one of the most important variables. I mean, especially if they have to walk long distances. I mean, I saw one paper recently that argued distance is more important for girls than for boys because of like safety issues getting to school. Yeah. So on average, how, um, what's the commuting, commuting time uh, for those kids? I don't think they report. We just know what school they went to. I don't think they say how many minutes. There is a routine in R where you can figure out travel time, like corresponding to, because they actually take into account the transportation options. You can compute distance different ways, you know, just like as the bird flies or whatever, direct distance, or you can take into account the time with the roads. We, we've just been computing it like direct distance. Um, I guess for most of them, they don't really have to climb a mountain to go to the school, I presume. Yeah, but I mean, you could have like a river in between or something, you know, 
Um, or definitely in rural areas, they don't have them a roads sometimes. But we could look at like average distance traveled. I think 20 kilometers that we did is a little large for the radius. I think it's more like within 10 kilometers that kids don't, don't often go outside of 10. 